So we are on point number eight in your notes from the first week, and you should have had that note, so please uh, save them, and save the one you're receiving from today. Um, so when we come back next week, uh, we would have those notes. And now I know that sometimes we forget that's all good. We'll have extra notes here, but try to put them in your Bible so it stays in your Bible. Number, point number eight, uh, what is the Bible state on gender and identity? So well, there are a couple of sub points under that. What is the Bible state? And this is going to be an expanding issue here as we talk about what the Bible states because uh, for session three as well, we would have uh, information uh, that I'll be sharing with you, session two and session three, that I'll have information on what the Bible states on gender and identity. There's a lot that the Bible talks about. And so first of all, we need to understand that personal fulfillment is the ultimate goal. That's what contemporary society thinks about. What makes me happy? Individuals have the freedom to define themselves as they see fit. And questioning their self-perception is often seen as an act of hate rather than love. I mean, you know that. I mean, even if we make a decision and someone steps in and tries to question that decision, immediately, however we try to soak it in love and kindness and gentleness, it is immediately perceived as a threat against our autonomy. Now, this is as believers. Now, think about the unbelieving world out there. Um, and the sexual revolution has played a significant role in promoting the idea that personal fulfillment is the ultimate goal. Personal fulfillment. And this is achieved by following our own emotions and desires. So you live to be happy. And so in a relationship, in a, in a family relationship uh, between a husband and wife, is if the husband is not satisfying the wife, then you're not bringing me happiness. And so if there's no happiness, I need to find an alternative because it's all about me and my happiness. That's how we work in this world. It's we are so individualistic. And we're living in a, in a time of relativism, which allows us to pursue these objectives without facing any challenges to their validity. In fact, if you turn on the TV and, and watch any soap opera, it all has the same worldview. If it makes you happy, stay in the relationship. If it doesn't make you happy, bail out of the relationship, right? It's an individualistic society. Personal goal is the ultimate Personal fulfillment is the ultimate goal. So what's the basis of our decision? And oftentimes, it is us. It's how we perceive it. Uh, we base our decisions based on our rationality. In fact, more often, our emotions. Or it could be a combination of both. And it has become so ingrained in our cultural climate that we often overlook it, assuming it's obvious, natural, and unquestionable. I feel it this way. Don't question me about it. This is absolutely because I feel it that way. It must be true. Right? Because I feel so. I wouldn't feel like that if it wasn't true. So it's, it's deeply ingrained in us and in our cultural climate. And as you talk to people, immediately they would ask you the same thing. So, how do you feel? What, do you, what makes you, what's going on? Now, what are your emotions? Well, if your emotions are, then you got to really think through this again. Because if it doesn't bring joy to you, there must be something wrong here. And so we solely rely on our feelings, our reason. We rely on our self as a foundation for decision making and determining what is right. Keep in mind that the decision we make affects others. 
It affects others. Because we live in a community where every choice we make impacts those around us, often in unforeseen ways. How can we determine that our decisions won't adversely affect others' lives or joy or, you know, their fulfillment at any given point in time. Uh, we don't have absolute certainty on the decisions we make. None of us have absolute certainty. And none of us have the authority or the right to take actions that harm others, including consequences that elude our awareness. We may not know at this point in time, but you don't have the absolute understanding to make a decision without knowing that it could impact someone else. It could. And so you got to be so careful. But we're living in a society, we're living in a culture where it's all about us. So we really don't care how it impacts other people. Mom, it makes me happy. Don't, are you concerned about my happiness? So if it makes me happy, then you must say yes to it. If you don't say yes to it, then you don't love me. Well, well how, much of you, how, much, how much understanding do you have? I'm just addressing this with children and parents. Let's put it this way in the perspective. Now, parents could be unbelievers, believers, but in all sense, whether believers, unbelievers, parents are perfect or imperfect. Welcome to the real world. There's only one perfect parent. Who is that? God. And what kind of children does he have? Except you two? <laughs> all. All of us imperfect, right? So let's have that paradigm in mind. Let's have that picture in mind. So when you think about parents, especially believers and children, how much understanding do the children have about the decisions they make as opposed to the parents who have gone many, many years ahead of them, gone through different situations in life, circumstances in life? The parents have much more experience. So it means when the children make decisions, do the parents have an ability to say, you know, son, daughter, child, honey, whatever you call them, I'm not really sure it's good for you to make that decision. Why? Because I've been there. No, that's just generation gap, parents. You don't understand. We live in a different planet. No, we don't. You see, we don't have the perception to make those kind of calls because we haven't gone through situation in life. True? And that applies to all of us. And so we got to be really careful how we make decisions in life because some of the decisions we make in life may impact other people in unforeseen ways. Next, and it's... Um, on your next uh, page there, uh, we do not truly know ourselves. We've seen that. Do we truly know ourselves? We have never experienced life before, have we? To the fullest extent that all the decisions you make, you know, know exactly how the turnout is going to be. We have an idea that this decision may turn out like this. But we have no clue on what that decision, how that decision is going to impact someone else. And by the way, we got to think about someone else because it's not about us. Yeah? We, may, we have never experienced life before, and while we may identify a problem hindering our fulfillment, we cannot guarantee that we have accurately identified the appropriate solution. We are unaware of how we will feel, who we will become, or what our needs will be in the future. If we had acted upon every appealing feeling or thought during our youth, our lives would be significantly different today. Had I operated on my feelings growing up, just did what I wanted to do without any guardrails, you probably wouldn't see me standing here today. Is that true for all of us? And somehow by the grace of God, God brings us back. 
But we have made decisions in life that have impacted us big time. So how can we we trust our decisions? That's point number six. I mean, sorry, page number six, three. How can we trust our decisions? We must question ourselves. Can we truly be trusted to desire what is truly best for us? That's a question we need to ask. Am I in the right place to make that decision for myself? What does the Bible say? There is wisdom in a multitude of counselors. <laughs> Depends on what kind of counsel. Oh, I, I love the counsel, but I just don't like this counsel. I'm just going to go to my worldly buddies who think like me. You remember an example in the Bible? Solomon, his sons. I mean, sorry, his son, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam made a decision. People in the country said, your father's laid taxes on us. You, know, you need to lower the taxes. And the wisdom he was received, received is what? You need to lower it. But he was not happy with that, decision, with that wisdom. Where did he go? To his buddies. He said, no, you got to increase the Lord. And lo and behold, the kingdom was split. We like, we, 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 the question we need to ask ourselves is, can we truly be trusted to desire what's truly best for us? We have all succumbed to our feelings in ways that we have later regretted. True? We have regretted saying things we shouldn't have said. Every day of our life, we regret it. We open our mouth, boom. Some of us are like Peter. Speaking unkindly to a loved one. Have we done that? We act on our emotions. And just being cautious before you open your mouth. That's why, you know, God's guarded us with teeth so that tongue doesn't just fall out. <laughs> but in spite of it, it just slips out, right? And just says things and then we regret or think about your days. Have we neglected to study for an exam that we ought to have studied? And maybe later regret? So it becomes evident that relying solely on the self as a source of authority, knowledge, and trustworthiness is not a reliable approach. Can we affirm that? Beloved, I take things so seriously that if I have to make a decision, I don't know, sometimes I overdo it. I talk to multiple people. I mean, in the last couple of months, I may have contacted eight or nine pastors just to get wisdom on some of the things I have to go through in church. Why? I'm not going to trust on my because I want to be careful. Why? Because the decisions I make will impact not just me, not just you. It impacts a bigger audience. And so we got to be careful how we make our decisions. How we make our decisions. It's important. You teenagers, people, young people, be careful as you make decisions. Uh, finding a spouse for your life. It's a decision that needs to be soaked in prayer. It's a decision that needs to be talked with your parents. It's a decision that needs to be talked to your grandparents. Remember, we are not living in an individualistic world, right? I mean, we are, but as believers, we ought to be thinking about other people. It's not just what brings us joy. Talk to our pastors. Talk to our elders. Gain wisdom from them. Glean wisdom from them. No. I've made up my mind. That's good for me. I've talked to two people. I've talked to my aunt and my uncle. They're okay with that. Yeah. So let me come to the authority. The authority ought to be the scriptures. The authority of scriptures. The Bible presents an alternative narrative. 
offering a different perspective on where to seek perfect authority, perfect knowledge, perfect trustworthiness. Agree? Not kind of shaky, uncertain. 2 Timothy 3.16, right? All of God's word is sufficient for what? Profitable for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped unto every good work. So the Bible is all sufficient, authoritative, perfect, trustworthy. In fact, the very first sentence of the Bible is profound. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the rest. It doesn't about go about proving the existence of God. It just assumes the existence of God. God. The proclamation reveals that the world has a creator, a maker, and he possesses inherent authority over all his creation. So if you really want to know what someone says anything about anything, you need to know what God says about that. And the only place you can go to find what God says about that is what? The Bible. The creator knows his creation. Don't you think so? He possesses perfect knowledge. And as part of this creation living within it, God has a right to guide us. God has a right to dictate what we should do. He possesses the necessary knowledge to understand what is best for us and the world at all times. And sometimes you may have to wait on the Lord for a long time because he is never late. He is always on time. Our biological clock may run out, but God's never turns out. Oh, you got to make that decision right now because if you miss this moment, you've lost it. Oh, really? Don't you believe that God is sovereign? What happened to Job when everything was taken away from him? How did God bless him? Double. Is God capable of doing that? Is God capable? No. Some of you I see, I've got legacy joining today, so I've got to make it applicable to them as well, right? High school, college. Sometimes the world tells you, listen, ladies, your biological clock is ticking, you got to find the right guy. If not, you'll probably stay single all your life. Well, singleness is also a study we're going to do because there's an aspect of singleness. we got to be content with that. Singleness is not a sin. Is it a sin to be single? No. no. It may be God's desire sometimes. And we pray, Lord, if there is an opportunity that you would bring the right guy into my life. But, Lord, I'm, my clock is ticking. It's ticking. It's ticking. It's ticking. And then I'll probably see some things on my face that I shouldn't be seeing. And I'm getting older. So you got to get the guy. Otherwise, I'm just going to go hunting for this guy. It's not a Redeemer Bible. I'm here to go somewhere else. And I'll go and I'll pray. And the, 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 the guy that comes with the, the jacket that day, maybe a gray or a navy blue jacket, and he's raised his hand up. He's guy. <laughs> listen, guys. Listen, girls. We can trust in God's timing, right? Yeah. Because he is our creator, and he knows what you need. Don't you think he knows what you need? I'll, tell, I'll put it in this perspective. He gave his son for you upon the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood for you. It would be like if I gave my son to die for you and you come and ask me for a candy, don't you think I'll give you a candy? I mean, if I can give my son for you that he gave his life for you, what's a candy like? What's a candy for me? So let's have that understanding that the creator knows his creation. 
He has perfect knowledge. And he has a right to guide us and dictate what we should do. He possesses the necessary knowledge to understand what's best for us and the world at all times. Because you have a creator. You can fully trust him. He knows what is best for you. I mean, he is so invested in your life, in your well-being, that he came in the person of his son, sacrificed his life for you on the cross of Calvary. The Bible talks of a crucified savior, right? A redeemer. He loves you more than you love yourself. Isn't that what Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make what? Your path straight. So you can trust in the Lord with all your heart because he is invested in your life more than any other person on planet earth. And a crucified creator alone has the authority to guide us, to give us a wisdom, what to discern, what is best for us. He has the rightful authority to demand our obedience. God genuinely understands what's truly best for each one of us and desires it for us. When the God who possesses authority, knowledge, and trustworthiness instructs us to take certain actions, those instructions actually lead us to freedom. Is that correct? Correct. When the Lord gives you and he has full authority and he has full knowledge and he can be trusted and he is instructing you to live according to a set standards and you follow those standards, you have you have full freedom in those standards. Otherwise, you're enslaved. It leads you to true freedom. That's why James chapter 1, verse 25. Let's turn there quickly. James chapter 1, verse 25. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. And it's coming from a heavenly father. And so when we are told to obey God, what we mean is that we recognize the worthiness of God to receive our obedience. And so he's given us the word, right? And he's given us people around us. Sometimes use secondary means to bring about obedience in our life. Yes or no? And our parents is one means. The Bible says honor your father and mother, right? Does it say honor your father and mother only they are? Or is it honor your father and mother when? Always. Always. Not when they are good to you. Not when they are kind to you. Always. So we have God the Father. And by the way, parents are one. Is church a possible place where the church as a community comes alongside you? If I'm making a decision, a serious decision, I really want to know what the church thinks about it. If I was a young guy and I'm looking for a gal, no, Vivi, I'm not. <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> married to my bride for 19 to 29 years. So, not, not 19, 29. <laughs> Feels like just yesterday. What I'm trying to say is, if I were to be looking for, hypothetically, I would want to know what the church thinks about the person I'm going to marry. I would. I would bring that person and sit down with my pastor and say, would you please talk to her and see if she is the person. Is she, is she a woman of God? Take him to the, I'll take her to the elders. I'll take her to my parents. I'll take her to other people in the, in the church, other godly men in the church. I want to know what they think. 
because my life is not about me. It's about the community that God's put me in. And that's a local church. Agree? Sometimes we forget about that. We live life so individualistically that the local church doesn't have anything to do in your life. But that's a means that God's put in your life. Just like your parents. So the word of God is important. So sometimes when we we, we, we don't want to live by these kind of thoughts. You know, this is some of the conversations that you probably hear. Answers like this. That's the way I've always thought. Have you heard that? Oh, that's the way we've always, we always knew that. Oh, it just feels wrong, doesn't it? Oh, that's how I feel. That's your perception. Because sometimes when the word of God says, it may go against your feelings completely. You need to go with the biblical worldview because it alone has the authority to guide you and to lead you and to teach you and to help you understand true freedom. So the Bible offers hope, and I want to read through a couple of uh, references there. Second Timothy is what we've gone through, but it's always good to turn the pages and feel those for ourselves. 2 Timothy 3.16. One of the things that helped me actually learn to turn the pages of the Bible was actually turning to that. Because early on, I would say 2 Timothy, and I would know where 2 Timothy is early in my young days. So it, it was like turning to that, okay. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Um, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. And what does it do to the soul? Restores the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the Simple. And so all of those are synony synonyms for the word of God, the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord. In fact, if you go on verse, verse 8, precepts of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, verse 9, the fear of the Lord, not judgments of the Lord, they are more desirable than all of them are synonyms for the word of God. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of him. Through the true knowledge of him. How do we get the knowledge of him? Where do we find the knowledge of him? Through the word of God. You don't just sit on a mountain and hum your way to glory. And gaze at your navel to get the knowledge of him. The only way you can get a knowledge of the true God is by looking into the Word of God, by studying the Word of God. Um, the next one, it says the Bible commands against cross-dressing. I think this will be a nice time to get into our second packet because uh, homosexuality and all that will come up in the next topic. So if you haven't received one, raise your hand up. You should get one. The, the gender issue part two. So we're looking at gender and the Bible. Recognizing the inherent value of all individuals regarding of gender dysphoria. Dysphoria is confusion. People are confused who they are. I look like a, a female or I look like a male, but that's not what I feel I am. Gender confusion. Keep in mind that everyone, regardless of whether they experience gender dysphoria or not, are made in the image of God. True? 
They're all made in the image of God, every one. Uh, they should not be regarded as outcasts, weirdos, all right, or hopeless because they feel those abnormalities. They are individuals, male or female, created by God and designed for His glory. Let's keep that in mind. We are all created by God, created in His image. And God is gracious to us that He opened our eyes through the truth of His Word one day, right? That's what we're able to see. The Bible clearly teaches that there are only two genders, male and female. And we believe this because this is what the Bible teaches. The Bible is our authority. You see why I had to lay the foundation for the Bible? You see how are we kind of went through our arguments, not by what we feel our authority has to come from the Bible. We had to lay that to rest. That's our foundation. Because what we're going to talk now, if our foundation is not right, then everything falls apart. We all go through suffering and trials because of the consequence of Adam's fall. Garden of Eden affected every one of us. Every one of us. And if someone feels that their gender doesn't match their biological sex, it doesn't mean that they should change their body. But instead, what they need to do is embrace the truths that are found where? In scriptures. What they need is a transformation, not transition. Instead of striving for transition of their gender, they should look to transform their hearts. Understand that sexes are not arbitrary or devoid of significance. The society may promote gender neutrality, but the Bible clearly provides that there's male and female and there are male and female roles and male and female identities. This is how a male is and this is how a female is. They're not arbitrary or random. There is to be no confusion between sexes. Nor is there any confusion in the 66 books of the Bible. There's no confusion. The Bible is very clear. These are timeless truths. And we got to listen to those timeless truths. Keep in mind that there are two worldviews of sexuality. There is a worldview that is given by God. And there is a worldview that's given by Satan, the serpent, in the Garden of Eden. One is a divine worldview. The other one is a pagan worldview. Agree? And when you're thinking about the worldviews, each of those worldviews teach a different story. Teach a different story. We know that one is pagan and one is divine. One is given by God. The other one is given by the serpent. If you choose to embrace the serpent's worldview, whether knowingly or unknowingly, means we do whatever we want as we follow our sinful desires. Because our nature is sinful. And when we follow what our nature wants us to do, we are basically enslaved to our sinful desires. And we got to understand, we are born with the sin nature. We don't get transformed into having a sin nature later on in life. We are born with the... The Bible says, in sin, my mother conceived me. We were born with the sin nature. And so right from the get-go, from the day we are born, we need to know how to act. In our sinful nature. Mama feeds the baby and puts the baby down. It's full. Diapers change. Everything. What does the baby do? 
No. Acts up. Why? I'm selfish. I don't care you're tired and exhausted. I want you to carry me and just walk around. I like that. Okay, yeah. Vipers and diapers. Who said that? Vadi Bakam. Yeah. According to the serpent's way of thinking, sex has no design. Our bodies have no purpose, no script. There's no higher authority. You are your own authority. Didn't I talk about it a couple of weeks ago? We have come a point in time where we used to question authority. Now we are the authority. We are like a tabula rasa, right? Blank slate. Write your own story. A couple of years ago, there was a book that came out, a Christian book, uh, Wild at Heart. Don't even read that book. I don't remember the name of the author, but the last page was, write your own story now. It's a blank chapter. Write your own story. So they say we are a blank slate, free to chase our passions wherever they take us. You have the wings, just fly. Rather than viewing your bodies as a precious gift from God and a masterpiece to be cherished, the body is seen as a blank canvas to be shaped according to our desires. You do whatever you like if it brings you joy. Uh, today, if you follow the serpent's way of thinking, we are not governed by submissive worship and obedience. Instead, we are governed by expressive individualism. The culture states that we are humans when we express individualism. Treating life as a performance. Expressing yourself does not involve placing yourself under standards or authority, but rebelling against all standards. That's what you need to do. That's how you express yourself. Being authentic. Have you heard that word? Being authentic means just act the way you are. It doesn't matter. Just be who you are. Assert your individuality. Your uniqueness. Conform to what your friends think is what? Cool. Mom, I can't wear that. My friends will not think what? I am cool. I need to act what? Look what? Cool. Pastors want to look cool too. You've probably seen them with skinny jeans and blink. Tone, tattered jeans trying to gain a crowd, put a little slang there, innuendos, make the crowd laugh. Or you need to be affirmed. And by the way, that's what our culture is driven today. You need affirmation. If you're not affirmed, it's a cosmic treason against you in the world. No one affirms me. Have you heard that? Where did that come from? Oh, we all need affirmations. Why? Was Christ affirmed? Was the Son of God affirmed? <laughs> How? By the angels. By the angels, yes. <laughs> not here on earth. I was not that I know of. Yeah. Heavenly, yes, and that was. Bible says, uh, let's read that affirmation. Thank you for bringing that up, Carrie. But Philippians chapter 2. Philippians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Philippians chapter 2. 
Verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, emptied himself, taking what? The form of what? Bond servant. And being found, being made in the likeness of men, sinful men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason, God highly exalted him. Man did not exalt him. Man crucified him. God exalted him. So listen, beloved, we don't need affirmation. It's good to affirm, but don't desire it. It's good that we encourage other people, but don't desire it. It's a good thing to go out and say, thank you for doing what you're doing. Really appreciate you. I'm so awed, thankful for what the Lord has been doing in your life. You've been a blessing in my life. That's a good affirmation. We need those affirmations. We need to do those affirmations. But we don't live for affirmations. Or, yeah, someone to like, like us. Yeah, likes, yeah. Those emojis, yeah. I don't have a Facebook. I just look into my wife's Facebook. <laughs> That's easy way out, right? You want all the tea, you just have to look into someone else's Facebook. <laughs> so sometimes when she's looking, I mean, I don't think she has it anymore. I mean, she disabled it. Oh, you took it off. <laughs> anyway, so you see those likes, right? Oh, I posted something. No one's like me. My best friend, Diane, didn't like it. So we need to recognize that um, as we, we live our lives here. So let's come back to that. Um, it's point number uh, exploring. Where are we? On C. Okay. On C. So having seen the worldviews of sexuality and not going by the serpent's way of thinking, um, not a trying to assert your own individuality or your uniqueness or your inner superstar, or desiring to be approved of others and thinking that if it doesn't happen, it's a cosmic treason. Let's go on to observations from the Old Testament on gender and sexuality. What does the Old Testament say on gender and sexuality? I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 22. This is where I told you that we'll be looking at... Uh, cross-dressing. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. It says, A woman should not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. A couple of years ago, I think many years ago, um, probably back in 2007, 2008, I remember there used to be a guy walking around with a frock. And if you remember, he used to be on Albertson shopping somewhere around there by Middle Dunes. And, and I was a teacher at a school there, Descent Christian Academy, and the students getting a kick out of it because it was just, you know, they didn't see something like that. And then they would come over. There was somebody who was dressed like a girl. The Bible says, Deuteronomy 20, 22, 5, a woman shall not wear a man's garment. And when you read that, somebody has written a dissertation on this, just one verse. I mean, not dissertation, but... 
a couple of paragraphs in our dissertation. I'm sorry. But the words imply the action mentioned should never take place. Should never take place. That's what it means. The command is undeniable. A woman should never, never wear a man's garment, nor should a man ever, ever put on a woman's cloak. Let's not open that can of worms now. <laughs> if you were in Scotland and you would see, what's that called? Kilt. And if they come to Palm Desert and walk around in a kilt, they would be what? You would look. That's fine in Scotland where the culture permits that. It's manly there to be wearing one. So again, it's a very clear command. There's never a circumstance in which specific form of cross-dressing is permissible. So what is it about this that the Bible talks about? We need to talk about abomination. And it's on C, observations from the Old Testament on gender and sexuality. Introduction to the concept of abomination in the book of Deuteronomy. Abomination means a severe judgment. And the term abomination is used in the context of severe judgment of punishment that God imposes on individuals, on nations, for engaging in detestable practices. Detestable practices. That means actions that are morally repugnant, provoking God's righteous anger, and it results in severe consequences. There are not many behaviors and practices that merit such condemnation. So let's look at what the Bible says. In fact, the Bible classifies a couple of them. Spiritual idolatry is an abomination. Spiritual idolatry, child sacrifice is an abomination. Adultery, incest, homosexuality, temple prostitution, unlawful marriage. They're all abominations. The Lord takes those sins seriously. Sexual sins are taken seriously. Because these are sins that you're committing against the body. And the body is made in what? The image of God. God takes it seriously. Let's look at a couple of passages. Turn me to Deuteronomy chapter 7, please. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25. This is idolatry. The graven images of their gods you are to burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, or you will be snared by it. Why? For it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Listen, guys, the principle there can be used as we may not be worshiping in a third world country. We are in America. Or we don't see those, those kind of idols. But you know that idols can be anything that takes the place of God. Yeah. And by the way, again, coming back to the legacy group here. If you make a choice to marry someone who is not a child of God, then you would have Satan as your father-in-law. You know that. And you may think, well, somehow after we get married, you know, I will convince him or her to be a Christian. He'll slip into idolatry. And you'll be drawn away. Another place is child sacrifice. Jeremiah 32, 35. Could we turn there, please? Jeremiah 32, 35. They build the high places of Baal that are in the valley of Ben Hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech which I had not commanded them, nor had it entered my mind that they should do this, what? 
abomination. This is an abomination. Yeah. Jeremiah 32, 35. And then let's look at a few passages about adultery and, and sexuality. Let's turn to Leviticus. Leviticus 18, verse 22. Leviticus 18, 22. Now, you cannot take it any other way, okay? It's very clear. Leviticus 18, 22. What does it say? You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a woman or a female why it is an abomination even if the entire world does it and you're the only one on planet earth reading this verse and you say everyone else follows a different lifestyle you are still right if you're the only one standing is that clear because the bible says so I'm reading from the New American Standard, the most spiritual version. <laughs> Just for a I took a break from the ESV. I too. Or rather, I just found it on my desk. In a sense. <laughs> yeah. As one of the female. It doesn't matter. It's fine. Okay, <laughs> sounds better. It's an abomination. That's what's important. If it's not with a man and a woman, it's an abomination. A man and a man is an abomination. A woman and a woman is an abomination. Now, it's not just, listen, heterosexual relationship doesn't make it holy. Am I, am I, do I have to repeat that? Heterosexual relationship doesn't make it holy. A relationship between a man and a woman has to, to happen only in the confines of a marriage. Yes. Now, just because you took a private oath in your bedroom doesn't mean you're married. I've had that instance where someone say to me, you don't know what kinds of things that your pastor will hear. Just because you had someone say that doesn't make you married. It has to be in the presence of witnesses the law of the land and let the person say well I don't believe in the law of the land well God is working through secondary means now the law of the land doesn't agree to what definition of marriage is that doesn't mean that but still you need to recognize that it needs to be done because what goes wrong otherwise if you're not having any witnesses to stand for your marriage then what happens tomorrow in your privacy you can get rid of her and go with someone else and the cycle can continue. But I do it in the presence of witnesses in front of my church and people. And I have a ring that is given. Every time I look at my ring, it reminds me of my wife. Unless you take it off when you're in the store because you don't want to show that you're married. People do that because they want to flirt. Spiritual idolatry. Child sacrifice and sexuality are abominations. And the book of Deuteronomy refers to that as an abomination. And there are scriptures there. We can talk about it. You don't have to turn to all the scriptures. But, uh, I mean, you can put it down there in case you like. Deuteronomy chapter 7. I'm going to state those scriptures. I should have stated that. Deuteronomy 7, 25 and 26, of which you've read. Deuteronomy 13, verses 13 and 14. Jeremiah 32, 35, we looked at that, 13, 32, 35, Deut Deuteronomy 24, 2 to 4, Deuteronomy 22, 2 to 4, 24, Deuteronomy 24, verses 2 through 4. Which says, if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce, and puts it into her hand. By the way, that shows if there's a certificate of divorce, there has to be a certificate of marriage. 
That's an argument for people who say, well, we did it in the privacy of the bedroom. If there is a certificate of divorce, there has to be a certificate of marriage. And he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then a former husband sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she has defiled. For that's an abomination to the Lord. So biblical divorce, right? I mean, if a woman is just walking away from the husband because she doesn't like him, it's an unbiblical divorce. And there's more on our website. You can read up on that, what that looks like. And it's a sin. So acts like adultery, homosexuality, incest, temple prostitution, unlawful marriage are all subjected to an abomination. Abomination. Re Leviticus 20, verse 13. Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a woman as, sorry, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be surely be put to what? Death. Their blood is upon them. These are all considered abominations. So you see how God's original design is reinforced through Deuteronomy 22? Because instruction to dress according to one's biological sex is not arbitrary. Because it's very clear. You will dress like a man and you will dress like a? Female. That means there's man and there is woman. Male and female. It's set in stone by the creator. The creator decided. He was not confused. Men were expected to present themselves as men. Women were expected to present themselves as women. And if you cross-dressed, you are offending God because clothes matter to God. You remember what happened in the Garden of Eden when man sinned? They knew they were naked. God killed what? A lamb. Took the skin and clothed them. Clothes matter to God. Owen Strand has written this. He gets a credit. Abomination motive points us to the conflict of visions that unfold throughout scriptures. Sexuality is a major battleground in the war between God and Satan. There are not merely certain practices that are ideal for a Christian, a follower of the true God, and certain practices that are less than ideal. There are, in truth, two visions of sexuality that why for human adoption. So that means two worldviews, right? And you as a Christian, you got to accept, take the divine world view, not the world view that comes from Satan. Okay, let's keep going. The next point there. We're making good progress. Israel's expectation of sexes in ancient Israel. This is important. For countless generations, those who followed the God of the Bible, and I say this, the God of the Bible understood the clear difference and responsibilities given to men and women. They were not confused. We are, though. Young boys coming out of college, you can probably hear them say, it. well, if my wife makes more money than me, I could stay at home, be the what? Stay at home? Mom, dad. What do you call that? She makes more money. I can just stay at home and take care of the kids. I like to cook. Role reversal. There was no role reversal in biblical times. They knew exactly what the role of a man and the role of a woman were. Especially in the Israelite community. In the Israelite community, men imaged, imaged the glory of Yahweh. And they put their life on the line to protect women and children. True? That's what they did. The act of selflessness. That was God's creative design. Men go to war. Not women. That's a role reversal. Men go to war. Men protect the woman. Men protect the children. 
And they required to show it. It was not just private. They had to show it. David, when kings go to battle, what did David do? He was going through his walk on the terrace. But it's the sentence you need to care for. When kings go to war. Men go to war. Women don't. Let's turn to Judges. This is interesting. Judges chapter 4. And I give this credit to Owen Strain as well for this illustration. Judges chapter 4. Verses 6 through 9. The story of Deborah. Now let me back up. Verse 4. I'm reading from the New American Spiritual Bible. <laughs> now Deborah, a prophetess. She's a, she's a prophetess. She would look like a modern day feminist. But you had women who were prophetess in the Bible. It's very clear she was a prophetess. The wife of Lepidot was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now that was a unique circumstance then, not now. Now she sent and summoned Barak, or Barak, the son of Abinom, and Kedesh Naphtali, from Kedesh Naphtali, and said to him, Behold, the Lord God, the God of Israel, has commanded. What does he command it? Go. And what do you do? Go and march to Mount Tabor, and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali. Right? Men or women? Men. And from the sons of Zebulun. And I will draw to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. Then Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. She said, I'll surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey, so that you that you're about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. And then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Okay. So here's Barak. Had a summons from the Lord to go to battle to drive out the forces of evil Sisera. Right? That was a command. Where does it come from? From the Lord. And according to Borah, it was a guarantee of victory, right? Look at verses 6 and 7. It was a guaranteed victory. But what does, Deborah, what does Barak do? He balks at it, right? <laughs> at the divine commission. If you want to put it in, in kind of uh, technical language, he basically trembles in his shoes. I'm just putting it in a nice way. Yeah. And he reiterates. What does he reiterate? Unless Deborah travels with him, he will stay home guarding his own skin. It's like I gave an illustration last week. The doorbell rings at 2.30 in the morning. You look at the clock and you say, Hun, can you go see if who's at the door? He says, you, if you come with me, then I'll go. And we'll see the people of God held to a binary gender. When you talk about binary gender, you're male and female, right? That's of the binary gender. So people of God understood that. They understood what the Bible said clearly, that men go to battle, that the Lord has made men and women for his glory, but he has called men to certain duties, and he has called women to certain duties. Clear? Duties are very clear. In Deborah's mind, sexes are not interchangeable. But not in Barak's mind. Barak 
dishonored divine design because he became covered instead of being the man. He was destined by God. He was called to actively seek God's purpose for man. He was built for that. He was strong. He was physical. He was meant for adventure. His superior height, his strength, his power was not just for some village races out there. It was meant to go to war, not just to play football. It was meant to go to war to protect the women and children, not just to play soccer, but to go protect women and children, not to play golf, but to go protect the women and children, not to play anything else, pickleball, but to go protect the women and children. Have I covered everything? Yeah. Not to play video games all day, but to go protect the women and children. Don't blame me. I covered everything. He was made that way to lead his family. And Deborah understood this truth. She understood that a man who feared God should eagerly embrace the opportunity he had to be a warrior, to show determination, face the possibility of death in order to obey God and bring blessings to women and children. And he knew, she knew this was a divine opportunity. She knew this was an opportunity, a divine chance. And God's blessing would be upon him because, listen, Barak, you are destined to defeat the tyrant. You're destined to drive out Sisera. Unfortunately, if the men chose weakness as Barak did, the Lord would still accomplish his plan. Yes or no? Yes. Sadly, in this case, the sex that was not called to protect the woman and the children is now going to protect the woman and the children. Was that God's divine design? No. No, it wasn't God's design. I mean, at least, although she may be a feminist, it's worth noting that she specifically urges him Please step up and go do your job. Because she comprehends, and she needs some praise here, because she comprehends the distinction between men and women and the necessity for men to be men and to demonstrate their manhood. Is that clear? So there are two sexes in the Bible. Listen, beloved. There are clear roles in the Bible for women today. It's in the church. Please turn with me to, and this would be a di different topic. This is free tuition for you guys, Just, but listen to it. Um, First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. First of all, then, and I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. Right? First Timothy chapter 2. For all kings and foreign authorities, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires, what? All men to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. Keep going. For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all testimony given at the proper time, for this I was appointed a preacher. Now come to verse 8. Therefore, I want what? The woman? The man in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Now I know it's men clearly because Paul deals with the woman right after that. What do women do? Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing. That's what? Modesty. Woman, if you want to understand modesty, look at your wardrobe, talk to your husbands, talk to your parents, and talk to people, godly women in the church, because modesty is important. You cannot define your own modesty. Culture doesn't define modesty. Um, C.J. Mahaney has a good, a good video on how modesty is important 
Um, because you can bring stumbling for many men. And I'm not saying that the men are not responsible. But the women have a great responsibility in presenting themselves to the men in the church. Especially as you come to the church to worship. Modesty is important. So what is cultural definition of modesty may not be the biblical definition of modesty. That's a different topic by itself. But again, so men, women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as it is proper for women making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise the authority of a man, but to remain quiet, for it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. Is there a role? Is there a function? Yes. That's why we are careful that we don't parade our woman up in church, up and down, during communion or serving communion or up on the stage and making announcement. We don't do that. Because we just want to be faithful to scriptures. That's why we don't give opportunities and we don't open up the thing to pray because you could have some woman who's coming up there and she doesn't know all this and she'll start praying in the church and there you go. We want men to be praying. That's why women are not elders. And you probably hear what's going on with Rick Warren who actually appointed women to be pastors well, they should be actually brought back into the Southern Baptist Church because Southern Baptists, many of the women are pastors going against scriptures. That's a sin against the Bible. You gotta, you gotta take God's word, tear it apart to even suit women to be made in that role. You cannot. You have to. You gotta do spiritual gymnastics to make that happen. The Bible is very clear about it. But anyway, there's a role distinction. There. So what happens if there are no women in the church? If there are no godly men in the church? Well, pray for godly men. There was one church where uh, an acquaintance of ours was going, and he actually came to one of our Bible studies, and he was troubled because he was attending a church where the pastor passed away, and the wife, he took over as the pastor of the church. And the elders were supporting him, supporting her. And so she, he went and talked to the elders after hearing this Bible study. He said, the elders said, well, she's a good preacher, a good teacher. Well, what are those men doing? Well, if there are no godly men, you better shut down the church. Which is important to disobey the Bible and have a church or to obey God. Obey God. Or you have another man who will come on a Sunday and preach and you elders step up into the role of a shepherd. But that's exactly what happened in Deborah and Barak. There's a call given to men to rise up and be a student of God's word. Instead of the woman leading, the men ought to be leading. Men are not to be leading. So very clearly, if you see, men were designed to protect and support women, reflecting God's creative design. And we see that in the life of Barak and Deborah. I want you to turn to one more scripture and we'll close with this. Page 3. Look at Isaiah chapter 3, please. Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. Oh, my people, their oppressors are children, <laughs> and women rule over them. Oh, my people, those who guide you lead astray and confuse the direction of your path. Where are the men? Men were expected to guide, right? Men were expected to guide the people of God, but instead, who is leading the people? Women and children. Women and children. Listen. Beloved, if the man is not the leader of the house, guess who will be the leaders of the house? The women and the children. 
and Disney promotes that. You watch Disney shows, they make fun of men. Dads are the joke. What a nice place to stop, sober. <laughs>